the title we're working with, Software Design with UDL in Mind. It just kind of had a nice ring to it, so we'll, uh, so, so we'll roll with that. Um, I read an interesting book. I just finished one up before I, before I came, which is good because it's helped this presentation out. Has anyone else here read Factfulness? Anyone? Yeah, a couple have. Okay, so for those that, that have, uh, d don't give away the, the answers to the questions. The book asks some really interesting questions. Sometimes uh, the answers can be a little bit surprising, sometimes not. But I thought maybe we would do something really techy, and I would ask you some questions, and then with, with a show of hands, you can, uh, you can show me if it's A, B, or C. So the first question is, in the last 20 years, the proportion of the world living in extreme poverty, has that A, has it almost doubled in the last 20 years? B, has it remained about the same? Or C, has it almost halved? What do you guys think? Who Think A. If you think A, raise your hand. Okay, majority is probably A. What about B? About the same? Who thinks C? Almost half. A handful of people think C. Okay, so I'll give you guys the answers in a moment. The uh, Worldwide, the 30-year-old men spend about 10 years in school on average. What about women? A, 9. B, 6 years. Or C, 3 years. So who thinks A, 9 years? No one. Okay, who thinks B, 6 years? few people. And then who thinks C? Three years. Seems like the most people there. Okay. And then the last question is, how has the number of deaths per year from natural disasters changed over the last hundred years? So we see this in the news a lot. Has it more than doubled? Who thinks it's more than doubled deaths due to national disasters over the last hundred years? Several people. Remained about the same. Handful. And then decreased to less than half. Yeah, very few people think that as well. Okay, that's good. So I'll go back, give you the answers real quick, and move forward. Uh, the last 20 years, proportion of the world living in extreme poverty, it's, it's been cut in half in the last 20 years alone, which is pretty amazing, I think. Uh, worldwide, 30-year-old men have spent 10 years in school on average. How about women? How many years have women spent in the same age, uh, spent in school? Nine years. And I don't think anybody picked that, so I, I thought that was pretty interesting. And this is all really, you know, it's, it's in the last 20 years kind of stuff. Uh, all recent, and then number of disasters, deaths due to that, it's, uh, it has also decreased to less than half. So I tell you these things because often we think things are really, really bad. And they are sometimes really, really bad, right? But it's also interesting to know that things have gotten better. My big takeaway from this book, and I think we can all kind of, kind of uh, see this in our own setting, is that things can be bad and getting better, right? We think it's always an, an either-or scenario, but it can be both. And so I think this really has happened in education as well. So my background is, was an assistive technology consultant for about 10 years in the state of Kentucky. I worked with a couple of hundred different schools. Uh, so when I was, let's go back 20 years ago in education and think that you're in elementary school. Well, if you're a struggling learner, if you speak English as a second language, 20 years ago, that could be tough, right? That could be, you could have a tough road ahead. But today it's a lot different. I think of, uh, geez, I think I used to go around, some of you guys may sympathize, I used to go around and uh, get these kind of screens that we put over top of other monitors to turn those into a touch screen, right? You guys have done that before? I actually looked to see if I could find an image of one and I couldn't even find an image of one anymore, but now everybody here has a touch screen in their pocket, right? It's just crazy how fast, in a very short amount of time, how fast things have, have moved forward. Um, Technology is a good example of this, I, I think, and, and, it, and it really plays into what I'm saying. This is an example we occasionally use. So this is a writing before from a student. Occasionally people send that use our products will send some stuff in kind of before and after. So this was a student's writing. I mean, he wrote. It's just kind of hard to, uh, kind of hard to make sense of exactly out of what he was saying there. But then, you know, no training or anything. Here's some software to kind of help out with, like, word prediction and those sort of things. So two days later, same student. Right? He's wrote a novel and even, uh, even made some artwork at the end of it. So life-changing in just two days for the student, just getting some technology in the hands. That's something that wouldn't have happened 20 years ago, so I always think it's a good story. Uh, so I'm with Texthelp, and at Texthelp we make quite a few different products. Uh, Texthelp's been around for over 20 years now. I've been fortunate enough to work with Texthelp over the last seven years. We've really been doing some interesting stuff, so I thought what I would do, it's kind of a different approach. Um, I'm not really going to do a demo of products or anything, but I thought it may be interesting for you to know like, how we think about UDL when we're developing products, and maybe some things, if you're going and, and purchasing software and things like that, some things you may want to think about and look for whenever you're purchasing software. Um, so one of the products we make is called Read and Write. 
it's a, uh, it's, it's, it's a literacy toolbar that's got like text-to-speech and word prediction and these sort of things on it. If you guys are interested in seeing any of this stuff, there's a whole booth out there that we can show it to you. But one thing that we noticed uh, that's kind of a real rule that, that we try to follow is simplicity. And so the most popular version of Read and Write that we have, it's a Chrome extension and it's super lightweight. And I counted today and there are 16 options on the whole program. There are only 16 options, right? Our previous version of Read and Write uh, was, was, was a version for Windows. And every year we do release and we'd add all these new features that people asked for. And do you know how many features and options we had in that product over the years? We ended up adding 732 features that you could, or not features, but options that you could change. And you know what that did? It made it so complicated nobody could use it. Who's going to use something that has 730 different features? So the one thing, if you're going to have a product, or if you're going to purchase a product or have it in there, you want it to be simple. So I am not the most popular person because my role as a product manager is basically to say no when people ask for things, right? Because they want this feature and that feature and all that. But I do it because I know that if I add every feature that everyone asks for, then no one's going to use it. So the first thing you want to think about is simplicity. The next thing we think about is discoverability. So with Read and Write, uh, when I was in, when I worked in Kentucky, uh, people had site licenses of, of, the, of Read and Write there, and um, a whole school would buy a license so everyone could use it. But really, it was like three kids that used it in this one classroom during testing, and that was it. It wasn't used by everybody like we wanted to say that it would, was, right? But that's changed, and one of the things that's changed that is discoverability. So if you want software that people are going to use you need to make sure it is super easy to find. It can't be a complicated website that you've got to remember with complicated login details and all this kind of stuff. It needs to be something that is there in the environment where you already are. So a good example of this of Read and Write is there's a pu uh, purple puzzle piece that just sits at the, at the top of a dock. All students use this. It is not only the students that need help with reading or writing. All students click on this. I can look at our analytics at any time, and there are millions of students just clicking the toolbar button and stuff like that, which is really encouraging. I looked this morning and we're really close to having about 19 million users. That is crazy for this kind of software that just provides support, right? And I think it's, it's awesome that it truly speaks to universal design. But if you want that to happen, you need something that's discoverable, that's very easy to find. What we often find is that this gets pushed out. Sometimes the teachers don't even know it's there, right? But the kid sees the puzzle piece and they click on it and then they start using it and, and get benefits from it. Uh, so once you're in there, you know, it, it comes down and the toolbar comes down. And when we think about software, we are always thinking about universal design for learning. Um, for example, with Read and Write, if a student has text, that's great. Uh, I was doing an interview earlier, and we're talking about, uh, you know, takeaways from UDL. When I was working in classrooms, the first thing I always tried to do, universal design for learning does not require technology for sure. But one of the things that really helped me was I tried to find as much digital text as I could. Because once you have digital text, you can do a lot with it, right? You can have it read aloud. You can increase the font size. So that was always kind of one of the things I tried to do when I was working with students in classrooms. Uh, so, so the benefit of that would be here, right? If, if, if I have digital text like I have here, my daughter is always a, she always writes the stories for me so I can use these during demo and use without any copyright issues. So, <laughs> um, so here, for example, if I wanted this read aloud, I would click play. It reads it out loud. So that's great. If I have struggle with reading or English as a second language, the same thing, there's talking dictionaries, and there are picture dictionaries. There are, there's translation, again, if, if you're not sure what a word is because that's not your primary language, you'll be able to look that up. You'll be able to, you know, you can even download all this as an audio file and listen to it on your phone if you'd like. So those are the kind of things that we try to do when we're developing products. We, um, we also try to do this thing to where we work in as many places as possible. So again, if you want something that's going to be used, that you're purchasing, you need to make sure it's not something that someone has to go to a totally different environment to use. So like with the read and write software, what we spend a lot of our time doing is just trying to work where students are already working. So we want to work in slides, and we want to work in Microsoft Word, and we want to work in Chrome, and we want to work in Edge, all those sort of things. Uh, so we spend our time doing that, and that's where we spend a lot of our time at. But the takeaway from that is if, if you want something that is used, it has to be something you can use in a place that you're already at and accustomed to. Uh, so I think that's another thing that's important if you're um, considering any type of software supports. So that's on the literacy side of things. And then we started doing this thing recently with math. And uh, so as some of you may be able to relate with this. When I would go and uh, try to help out students in, in a classroom, a lot of times it was around this student really struggles with reading and they have dyslexia or something like that. And the idea would be, that's great. Let's get the book. Let's get this thing scanned. Let's make it accessible. Here's some software. It'll read it for you. We could do all that, and that was fine. I could do that all day. 
When I came into a math classroom to help a kid, now that was tough, right? Like creating digital math is not an easy thing. Usually the way you do it is you have to either know how to write kind of math code, which we call it LaTeX, some people may call it LaTeX. Uh, anybody familiar with that here? Right? Like seven or eight people, that's good. Yeah, some people are like, it's not the simplest thing, right? It's like it could be a foreign language requirement, I think, to, uh, to do. Or you also have palette-based editors, um, like Microsoft Word has some built in. And that's nice, but they're really complicated to, to, to work. And then once you insert it in there, it's not accessible. So you will have it digital, but it's not like you can have it read aloud or anything like that. So recently we've been thinking about a lot about math, and uh, we've got a guy named John McGowan that's joined our team. And John was an international schools teacher, and he was at one of those high-end international schools where every kid had a $1,000 MacBook. And uh, kids would always hate coming into his class because they had to put their computer away because it's math, and you don't use technology with math, right? So he said, well, I'm going to change this. So he made a, a little add-on into Google Docs that helped teachers to make digital math and help students to, to create digital math. It wasn't really accessible, but he was trying to do his thing. Before we knew it, there were three million teachers that were using it, and they were emailing him, asking him questions, and he was spending all of his all night trying to reply to questions. Then it turns out we ran into him at a conference, and he decided to uh, to join up with TextHelp. And from what he uh, from what he made, we've we've turned this into to a product called Equatio, and it makes making digital math super easy. And not only is it digital, but it's also accessible. So the way that would work is um, the way we do this is there's different input methods. So if you wanted to create math, you could type it. And so do you know how many here has used word prediction today? Right, if you send a text message, you've used word prediction of some sort today, right? It's, it, it always recommends your words and stuff like that. So people are really used to this. So we thought, I wonder if you could do that with math. Turns out you can. So we went and found pretty much every combination of mathematical formula that you can think of. And if you start to type it in Equatio, it will just pop up and predict that for you so you can easily create that math. And then you'll be able to insert it into a slide or a document or a Word doc, wherever you'd want. When it inserts, it always includes the correct human spoken alt text and that sort of stuff. So if you're using a screen reader or a text to speech, it'll read that math aloud as well. If you don't want to type your math, that's fine. Uh, if, you want to, if you want to write it, you can. If you have a touch screen, since we all have those now, it seems, you can, you know, you can go in and write your math, and we'll instantly recognize that as uh, the written math, turn it into digital math, and then insert that in. We can even do the coolest thing. This is probably worth a demo. Uh, to where you can snap a picture of written math and it will instantly turn it into digital math that's accessible and insert it into a document with you. So uh, very cool things we've been able to do on the math side of things. And then last but not least, if you want to, um, you know, if you want to speak math, you can. You just give access to the microphone, start speaking, and we'll recognize any kind of math that you say. Again, we'll turn that into accessible digital math and we will uh, squirt that into the document just like, uh, just like any other kind of image, except it'll be accessible as well. So those are some things that we're trying to do on the math side of things. Hopefully this is useful for you. I, I wanted you to think a bit about like when we're making products, do we think about universal design for learning? We do. And these are the kind of things that we're doing to make sure that the students that need those supports do. And in this case, the teachers that may need the support would have that as well. Uh, so I always appreciate that is kind of my role and it's why I'm here. I appreciate you guys telling me, hey, we need this and do that. And uh, I go back and brainstorm with my team and we try to make some of these things a reality for you guys. We've also done an interesting thing too. So uh, if, if you don't already know this, just just find me afterwards or stop by the booth. But we made a change that uh, was pretty popular. That everything we do now is completely free for educators. Uh, so we do this freemium thing to where some stuff stays free forever. Uh, but we just we thought it, it just made sense. So anything that I show you here, it'll be completely free for you to take back and use and those sort of things. Uh, you just fill out uh, a little form with your email, and we will uh, we will license you. And then we've also taken the side of things to where we always try to find our most popular feature, the, the thing that people get the most out of or students get the most out of, and we make that free as well. So for read and write, students were by far using text-to-speech more than anything to have documents read aloud. Uh, so we just made that free. Wasn't the most popular thing with some of the sales folks to start. But uh, you know, it's just, a th it's just a thing that we do. And from that, uh, we've seen lots and lots of, of, of students benefit from that. The last thing I'll mention before I go, I know I'm about out of time here. This is probably what I'm most interested in. And uh, it turns out that assessing writing is a really difficult thing in school systems. And uh, so there are, I don't know, 100 or so people in here. If I had a writing sample and handed it to each of you, I would get 100 different scores back, right? Writing is a very subjective thing. And because of that, no one's really been able to see if students are making writing progress for some time. And so we started looking at the technology we do and how we integrate into Google and those sort of things. And we've created this little tool called RyQ. And now RyQ is going to allow you to instantly assess a doc with a common set of metrics. And we've had about 
70,000 documents scored by teachers using RIQ. And what that has allowed us to do is a really cool thing that, to my knowledge, has not been done before. Um, but if you score a document with RIQ, we'll instantly be able to tell you if that student is on grade level. Because there's not really norms for writing. So you don't know if a student writes if they're above grade level or below grade level and those sort of things. Uh, but now we'll know that because we've had 70,000 documents that have been scored by educators. We've had a really good agreement around it. And, uh, and from that, now we can look and instantly assess docs, tell you if students are making progress over time, and then compare that with a national norm set and allow you to create your own norm set. So this is just something that uh, is quite new for us, but it is what I'm most excited about at the moment. And uh, hopefully that gives you guys a glimpse in some of the things we're working on. So that's all I have for today. Uh, hopefully some of this stuff's useful for you guys. If you have any questions or want to chat about this stuff, I would love to nerd out with you over some of the specifics and get into some of the other kind of techie stuff we're working on uh, and, and chat on that. So I appreciate you guys listening to me for a bit today.